Good morning and welcome to the Tuesday Morning Bible Study on this March the 21st of 2023. Today we are in Mark chapter 9 and we are going to start with verse, uh, we'll start at verse 30, although I, I think we sort of touched on this last week. We'll start at verse 30 and then move on through the, at the very least, we'll we'll finish up for the, the rest of uh, chapter nine today. Okay. All right. Well, starting at verse, uh, well, anyway, uh, you'll, you'll remember last week, we, we had a really nice discussion about um, this, uh, this healing story, the healing of the, um, of the boy with a spirit and the father famously says, oh Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. And we saw how often, how healing stories in the gospels function. You know, they may very well be relaying, you know, real events, very possibly, but they also are told in such a way that they can function as parables also, parables of what is going on in uh, in the relationship between Jesus and the disciples. And we saw earlier how the story of the blind man being partially healed and then fully healed, uh, and kind of in the same way, kind of in the same way, there's this sense of that the this healing is going to proceed but you know the father has some faith he has some faith but he knows he doesn't have you know he doesn't have as much as he'd like to have or or uh, as he says lord i believe i really do but i know that i also have unbelief too so this is uh this you know this is in, maybe a real, you know, like an actual situation, but it's also a parable of the disciples where they are. They've got some faith. They've experienced some of this uh, kingdom power in reality, but they're not all the way there yet either. They see partly, but they don't see fully clearly either. And, and, so we see this played out then in some of the some of the encounters that uh, that are going on here. All right. So in verse thirty, starting in verse thirty, Jesus again will foretell his death and resurrection. They went on from there and passed through Galilee. Jesus did not want anyone to know it. That is, he didn't want anyone to know that he was there in Galilee, for he was teaching his disciples and saying to them, the son of man is to be betrayed into human hands and they will kill him. And three days after being killed, he will rise again. But they did not understand what he was saying and were afraid to ask him. <laughs> Let's just sit with that for, sit with that for a second. love the honesty of they were afraid to ask him <laughs> I, I don't understand this <laughs> yeah uh, you know you, you get the sense that they they kind of know that if they ask him they reveal their not getting it reveal their unbelief reveal whatever and jesus is just going to go <laughs> You know that he, it's like Jesus has already had some some weak moments, you know, where he's he's uh, kind of uh, been flustered and frustrated and uh, afraid they're going to do that, do that again. It's like sticking your head in the sand. If yeah. you don't see it, it won't happen. Yeah, right. Right. Well, that's and that's the other thing is that they still, you know, we he's they've been told now. This is now the second time in this narrative that they're told by Jesus that he's going to get killed when he gets to Jerusalem. Uh, and we saw how we saw how Peter reacted to that. And, you know, 
pulled Jesus aside and said, no, you know, this will never happen to you. And then Jesus jumps on Peter, you know, and says, uh, you know, get behind me, Satan, for your speaking as you're thinking as people think and not as God thinks. Um, just because Peter got rebuked there, Peter knows there's something wrong with his reaction. Still doesn't, it doesn't mean that Peter understands why this has to happen or even understand or even fully understands that it's going to happen. Maybe Jesus is just being pessimistic. You know, maybe Jesus is uh, uh, setting the expectations low, you know, <laughs> you know, so that uh, people don't get their hopes up too much. You know, I mean, it, just because Peter has been rebuked doesn't mean Peter understands. He still doesn't see clearly, just like the blind man after the first application didn't see clearly. He still looked out and saw people like they were trees rather than they were rather than being people um and apparently that if that's true of peter that's also true of the disciples they still they still have really no idea what jesus is talking about um they they know enough to know they don't want to know more right oh that's good yeah that's a good way of putting it yeah they know enough that they don't want to know anymore um yeah 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 it's like you know you you know you get an inkling that something bad's gonna happen and you just as soon you just as soon want to stop talking about it you don't want to know the details don't want to know the details and mm -hmm. uh and, mm -hmm. and you know and 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 of course a big part of them thinks that there's got to be a mistake right there's got to be i didn't hear i didn't hear right i didn't hear right I yeah, right. but, I mean, but I don't. Yeah, I have a problem with my sight and my faith. There's got to be something wrong with my hearing too, you know. Right, and I don't want it corrected. <laughs> right, <laughs> you know, and it's it's worth you know it's worth reflecting just on for ourselves, you know, how many times it's true in our own lives how we we sort of we sort of know something, but we really don't want to know it, and we certainly don't want to know anymore. Uh, you know, we just want to stop talking about it. Uh, but Jesus evidently thinks it's important that the disciples be given fair warning, fair warning of this. Now, of course, it's not all bad. I mean, there is talk of, yeah, you'll get, yeah, I'll get killed, but I'll also rise again too. But of course, that's all totally lost on them. Uh, totally <laughs> lost on them. For personal reasons, certainly, they love Jesus. They don't want to see Jesus get hurt uh, or die. But it's but again, it's also completely other than anything they've ever been, they've ever come to expect about the Messiah. If they really do, at this point, believe Jesus is the chosen one, that he is the, the, the Messiah, it's just inconceivable that anything like this would happen to him and that he somehow or another he must be either wrong or exaggerating or you know there's something going on because that's just not what happens to messiahs yeah i mean that if you're the messiah that isn't what happens to you and uh and it's important to know it's important to know right now just along those lines that this isn't just a Jewish thing. I mean, literally, if this message of a great deliverer, a great, a great figure like this, were to come in any culture, there's no culture that would interpret that as, oh, well, of course, he's supposed to suffer and die. You know, she she's supposed to suffer and die. Yeah, literally, no culture on earth would go there, you know. Um uh, and certainly in this uh, in this uh, Jewish culture, this this apocalyptic expectation of a of a great Messiah figure, uh, it is it is historically true. I mean, I mean, I mean, that's a psychological aspect of it that no culture would even it would even it would never occur to anyone that that would happen. 
But culturally and historically speaking, it is, it is also true that in Jewish theology, in Jewish theological speculation about the Messiah, literally no one in the history of Jewish theology up to this point had ever said, had ever said that this messianic figure would suffer and die. Now, later on, you know, after Jesus dies, raised, all of that, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of rethinking and revisioning and there's a, there's a, an expression of the Christian gospel based on the death and resurrection of Jesus that makes it all sound, well, I mean, presents it as the plan of God from the beginning, presents it as the plan of God from the beginning, as the way it was always going to be, a sense, you know, a sense of inevitability. And, you know, and that's what we're used to. You know, that's how we, that's how we hear the message when we come up through the church. We hear it as the plan of God from the beginning. And maybe it was, but that's not how it was experienced by those first disciples. It was only experienced as inevitable after the fact, as they're living through this in real time. There's nothing inevitable, inevitable about it. Yeah. So could I just ask something about, um, yeah. go back to just a few of your statements. For you. Yeah. What are those uh, fertility and vegetation myths preceding Jesus, which do, which do indicate that the king must die. Uh -huh. you know, uh -huh. The story of Jesus, of course, has been by uh, Frazier and others in the Golden right. Valley related to those patterns of thinking that were that yeah. preceded in the Again, Middle East. Yeah, was, yeah no, why. absolutely, absolutely. All I'm after just, the fact, though. You know, it, it it's all after the fact. It's 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 when you're when you're a disciple and you're confronted with this, you know, what in the moment feels like an inexplicable tragedy. And then not everybody experienced it this way, but but some people in the early Christian movement clearly experienced something that they interpreted in, form, in the form of resurrection. I mean, whatever they, whatever exactly they saw, whatever exactly they experienced, they experienced it as resurrection, as vindication of everything Jesus said and did. But it's, and it's only then, it's only after that, that it ever occurs to anyone that there might have been something inevitable about it. Those very scriptures, those very scriptures that later Christians um, would apply to the dying and rising Messiah, this uh, Isaiah 53, the suffering servant uh, of Isaiah 52 and 53. Um, this is the significance of what I said before about Jewish theology. Literally, no one in Jewish history, from the time that prophet, from the time that scripture, Isaiah 53, was first written down sometime in the mid-6th century BC, for 550 years, literally no one interpreted that passage as foretelling a dying and rising Messiah. Literally no one including the early Christians, and never interpreted that way until after Jesus's death and resurrection. It was after their experience of the resurrection that they then, as they are processing what happened and the meaning of what happened, did they go back to their scriptures 
And remember, they didn't have the New Testament. They had, I mean, it was the Old Testament. It was the Torah and the prophets and the writings. You know, they go back to their Old Testament scriptures. And it is in light of their experience of Jesus that they go back and they see things that they didn't see before. Because their experience made it possible for them to see things that they didn't see before. Remember the story of uh, the the Emmaus story, uh, Luke, um, I believe it's uh, Luke chapter 24, I believe, where um, Jesus appears, uh, the, the two, the two, uh, the two disciples are are walking back to Emmaus from Jerusalem, and they encounter this person they don't recognize, you know, and they get into this conversation, and they're expressing their despair about how, uh, you know, this, this Jesus who was mighty in word and deed before the people, you know, we had thought he was the one who to would be the one to redeem Israel, but he was crucified. And now we're hearing these weird reports, you know, that, you know, some among our group say that they've seen him alive, but we don't know what to make of it and all this. And then the mysterious figure who we know is Jesus, we, we, we know it's the raised Jesus. What he says then is, you know, uh, you know, he takes them through the scriptures and he shows them things in the scriptures that not only had they never seen, but literally no one in Jewish history had ever seen, okay? Things that would be, frankly, impossible to see, but for the experience they had just had. And so then, in light of their experience, and with the help of, as it turns out, the risen Jesus, helps them to see things that were, in fact, you know, from this point of view, prefigured. But again, no one had ever, ever applied those texts to the Messiah before. Uh, and so, uh, you know, there again, there are things that make sense in hindsight that no one would ever see coming. Um, this is the struggle. You know, I mean, obviously this was a struggle for the first Christians, but it's a struggle for those Christians in Jesus's own time, or I'm sorry, in Mark's time. When Mark is writing this gospel, we've said, or we have said from the beginning, this is a wartime gospel. This is a gospel that's being written in the context of the Jewish rebellion against Rome in the late 60s to about the year 70, 72 or 73. OK, and there are and the Christian community specifically. And and even more specific, the Jewish Christian, the, the Christians of Jewish ethnicity were especially under pressure because they were getting it from two sides. They were getting it from the from the non Jesus accepting Jewish community. But they were also getting it from. They were also getting it from, uh, I mean, they were feeling the pressure from within, because they were they were Jew, they were Jews too. They were Christians, but they were Jews too, and they felt a commitment to their people. Certainly, feeling a commitment to their people with with the Romans, you know, coming in against Jerusalem, they would feel that, and yet they also have Jesus preaching, you know, preaching nonviolence you know, preaching, don't, you know, don't rise up in rebellion against Rome. Well, from the Jewish, you know, from, from the Jewish point of view, even many, even some Jewish Christian point of view, you know, you're a traitor to your people. If you don't rise up, you know, grab your sword, and your spear and go fight against the Romans. You know I mean? You're, you're, you're a coward or you're whatever. And so, I mean, they're just getting it from every side. And the, so, and the, so they are enduring a special kind of suffering, and 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 suffering for it. I mean, really, really suffering for it from others, and the and and so their position is not understood. And what Mark's message to them is essentially, it's essentially this. Guess what? Jesus wasn't understood either. 
In fact, he was so not understood, he was not even understood by his own disciples. <laughs> okay. And in the spirit of what Jesus said about, you know, uh, those who would, uh, you know, uh, if you would follow me, take up your cross and follow me. Those who would save their lives will lose it. Those who lose it for my sake will find it. I mean, Mark's message to them is essentially, you know, if this if this suffering and death is good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for you too. You know, don't expect to be treated when you take this stand. Don't expect to be treated any differently than Jesus was. This is what happened to Jesus. It's going to happen to you too. And so as it is happening to you, don't don't expect it to be any different. Stand firm. Uh, you know, stay, stay, stay with the program. You know, I mean, I mean, stay on the path. It's encourage. It's meant to be encouragement. It's meant to be strength, but it is also meant to be real. It's not telling the these these struggling Christians, well, God doesn't. You know, uh, you know, God's going to. You know, God's going to rescue you at the last minute. God's going to, you know, God's going to uh, destroy all your enemies. And uh, no, no, any more than that, you know, just as it didn't happen that way with Jesus, it's not going to happen that way with you either. And so it's a hard word. It's a hard word. But to take Jesus's word seriously, that as you do this, as you stay faithful, as you stand firm, you will paradoxically gain your life. You will, you will find life in the midst of this. And, and clearly, resurrection is an essential part of this message it's just as death is true of jesus resurrection is true of jesus resurrection hope whether experienced on this side of death or on the other side of death or both is part of the message of hope that mark wants his Christian contemporaries to get from this. That, yeah, death is ahead. Resurrection is ahead. Stay the course. By staying the course, by following Jesus to the end, you will, you will gain your lives. You will gain your lives through this. This, and so it is, it, it is a message of encouragement for Christians who are really getting it who are really facing great hardship in the midst of this Jewish rebellion against Rome. Uh, now, in that spirit, in that spirit, and in the spirit of the disciples not getting it, not <laughs> understanding how in the world Jesus can be serious about, about his, coming, his coming suffering and death, the very next passage reveals just how off base the, the disciples are. They still can't let go of this idea that no, Jesus has to be somehow mistaken and that there really is going to be this, this triumphant setting up of the kingdom and that they're going to get, you know, good stuff's going to come out of, out of this for them. So let's look at verse 33. Then they came to Capernaum. Remember, Capernaum was, if, if Jesus had a home base in the midst of his ministry career, Capernaum, on the Sea of Galilee, in Galilee, uh, Capernaum was, it was Jesus's home base. Then they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, what were you arguing about on the way? But they were silent, for on the way they had argued with one another as to who was the greatest. 
<laughs> I mean, they were silent with one another because they know in their own minds, they either know it's wrong, that they shouldn't have been arguing a lot about that, or they don't fully know that it's wrong, but they know Jesus will think it's wrong. <laughs> they will they know Jesus will jump on them for even having this discussion. Okay. So what were you arguing about on the way? But they were silent, for on the way they had argued with one another who was the greatest. He sat down, called the twelve together, and said to them, Whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. Then he took a little child and put it among them, and taking it in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. Okay. Whose house and why was there a child there? That's a great question. Uh, it appears it was Jesus's own house. Okay, and this is the house. Uh, it appears this is at least the house. We know, you know, whether Jesus owns his house or he rents this house, it seems to be. It seems to be that Jesus did have a a kind of headquarters, a home base, in in Capernaum. Uh, so it seems to be his own house in some in some fashion. Seems to be his own house. Uh, now, as for the little child, we can only assume we we probably have to assume this that there were more people following Jesus around than just the twelve disciples. There were there were other hangers on that were following Jesus from place to place. Uh, it does appear that there were things Jesus said that he only said to the 12. But it also seems that there were things Jesus said often as he was just moving around that he was saying to people who were not among, who were not of the 12, but nevertheless, nevertheless kind of follow Jesus around. They were, you might think of them as like secondary disciples. I mean, for example, one really good example of a secondary, not secondary in importance, but secondary in the sense that they were not among the 12, would be Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene is somebody who almost certainly was traveling around with them, okay? Almost certainly. Uh, there were several Marys. Yeah, well, yeah, and there were other people too. I mean, but I mean, Mary Magdalene is the most famous, most mm -hmm. famous of these of, of these other people. She is not technically one of the twelve. You know, she's not one of the twelve apostles in that sense. But her importance as a follower of Jesus is, you know, unquestioned. Uh, there's even evidence, considerable evidence. That Mary Magdalene, I mean, far, far from the picture of her being, a, you know, supposedly being a prostitute or something like that, who had turned to Jesus. And I'll say more about that in a second. Uh, okay. That it, it is likely that Mary Magdalene was one of the chief financial supporters mm -hmm. of Jesus. Uh, it, I mean, it, it's, it seems clear. It seems fairly clear that Mary, along with certain other women, uh, were among the financial supporters of Jesus. It's positive. I mean, we don't really know much about Mary Magdalene. Um, it's very possible that she was a uh, that she was a widow. Very possibly. Uh, whether she was a widow or not. There's good reasons to believe that she was a woman of means. Okay. Whether whether or a widow or not, it seems that she was a, a person of means. She probably was a significant financial supporter of Jesus. It is certainly 
true beyond any question, whether she was a woman of means or a widow or not, she was very close to Jesus. She was very, okay. very, she was very, very close with Jesus. Tom, by this point, couldn't the child have been by certainly by this time, uh, brothers and sisters of Jesus might have had children. This might have been a niece or a nephew that was with their grandmother. Possible, possibly. It could, I mean, that is, that is certainly possible. That is certainly possible. Well, the child is just above a dog in the pecking order, too. I think that's why Jesus chose the child. Yeah, no, no, I, I agree. I agree. Yeah, they're no, just I mean, above the dog. Fact is, the text doesn't tell us who the child is. We, we don't know. It, it's, it seems fairly clear that Mark doesn't think it's that important. Uh, who the child is, but it certainly could have been, could have been, uh, you know, one of, you know, one of Jesus could have been uncle Jesus, you know, as far as we know, uh, Jesus or the, the child could have been a child of one of the disciples. Yeah. We don't know the chance of your lives. You know? Because it's, because it is clear from the book of Acts and from uh, some of Paul's epistles, we, Paul didn't have a family that we know of. But we know that Peter did. Yeah. We know Peter had a wife. We know Peter had children. We don't know anything about his wife or his children. Other than that, G Peter did, in fact, travel with them sometimes, or they came with him sometimes. Uh, you know, we get the sometimes we get the impression that when people left and, you know, they went and followed Jesus and, you know, left their poor wife and kids back at home, you know, to fend for themselves. Of course, that's not true. That's not what happened. Uh, that's not what Jesus asked people to do. Uh, and so it, it is a reasonable thing to think that, you know, that this could have been a child of one of the disciples. Uh, we, but at the end of the day, we don't know. And at the end of the day, if Mark, we know that if Mark considered it an important thing to point out he, he would have uh and he doesn't uh bill what bill says though is is truth is that children uh children in this day though treasured in one sense the fact of children was treasured you know i mean it was important from a Jew, you know just a general jewish cultural point of view to have children you know, you wanted to have children. Children on an individual one by one basis did not have very high standing. <laughs> okay, my you might have overstated it somewhat about the whole dog thing, but 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 on an individual case by case basis, they were not. They did not have very high standing. Uh, it was very much uh, in the spirit of uh, what my grandmother used to say about children being seen and not heard. <laughs> <laughs> kind of in that spirit and and uh, yet yeah. in the stories that we've had we've had two very important stories where right. it was children who were ill and parents who were begging jesus to come and so they they had to have had some standing at least in their own parents hearts yeah mm -hmm. oh yeah oh yeah no absolutely absolutely well, they, they were also an asset for working they were they yeah, were and that, that's the, sense, the fact of children yeah, why did in the 19th century have 12 children so they could yeah. work in the fields? Yeah, no, no, it, it's certainly yeah. the fact of children is 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 important uh, because you, uh, from the standpoint of work, but also the standpoint of uh, caring for widows in their old age, uh, that uh, that from a you know from a Jewish cultural point of view you know to be to be a uh to be a widow uh you know to be a widow and to not have children to look after you you know from a jewish cultural point of view at that's at this time that was considered just a a, a terrible fate you know uh that was considered how, how hard how hard was it for a widow to be a woman of means then wouldn't that very difficult very unlikely that a widow was a woman of means well it would have something to do with 
who she's the husband. widow of. <laughs> you know, right. who she's the widow of. You know, I mean, if she's the widow of a, you know, of a, just a, you know, just another peasant, then no, she's largely, she's almost entirely dependent on her children, which again goes to why children are, why children were valued. One of the reasons they're valued. Um, but it is in, it is also entirely possible that Mary was the widow of someone of a of a man of means who left her with you know with her, was with some property uh at the end of the day we don't know we don't know for yeah, sure if he had sons that property would go to the sons probably uh she would she would participate though she would participate in she'd be cared for by by the estate by her family uh it's entirely possible that mary magdalene herself might have been a widow well cared for didn't have any children of her own that we know of uh could be that she was the sole beneficiary or of her husband's uh estate we don't i mean at the end of the day we don't know she could have been privately you know privately of means you know without having been married um we don't know we do know she was very close she very likely would have been with Jesus and the and the other the others, you know, virtually all the time. Um, uh, and so uh, let me say one more thing. Let me say it doesn't have anything to do with the text, but let me do say this about uh, the common picture of her as a prostitute. Um, that is a uh, that is a longstanding Christian tradition that has no basis whatsoever in the scriptural text okay it is a it's a church tradition that dates back to approximately the 6th century AD okay it is not something that arose early in the church fathers in the writings of the church fathers there is no negative mention of mary magdalene at all Mary Magdalene is never portrayed as a as a former prostitute uh, at all. Um, it appears that the idea that she had been a prostitute arose in a sermon given by a pope, Gregory. Pope Gregory, Gregory in the <laughs> in the sixth century A.D. in the five hundred A.D. And he gave a sermon in which he was preaching on Luke chapter eight, where the where a woman comes in to where Jesus is and falls at Jesus's feet, and 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 she's clearly a woman of the night, and she washes Jesus's feet with her hair, and and then she's forgiven. She's forgiven by by Jesus, um, uh, and and sent on her way and what the what the pope did in this particular sermon is he linked that woman she is unnamed in luke chapter 8 but he links her to a mention of mary magdalene at the end of chapter 7 in luke where a list of women is given of women who were significant in Jesus's ministry with the suggestion that they uh, that they supported him. And this is where we get the idea that Mary may have been a woman of means. Uh, the significant fact there at the end of Luke chapter seven is that of the women listed, Mary is the only one listed who is not listed with a man. In other words, you know, woman A, the wife of blank, woman B, the wife of blank, and Mary Magdalene. <laughs> okay. <laughs> she is not listed with a husband. She is not listed as having had a husband. Uh, now, I could have said Mary Magdalene, the widow of, it doesn't say that either. It just lists her by herself. What the Pope did is he took that to mean that this single woman 
in Luke at the end of Luke 7, Mary Magdalene, is the unnamed woman of Luke 8, who is said to be a prostitute. And he links the two. Now, I'm not normally one to defend a pope here. What the pope was trying to do, what he meant to do, this is unintended consequences. What he was trying to do. Okay, let's okay, let's just name this. Okay, first of all, this was a bad exegetical decision. There's no reason. There's no reason to link seven and eight in this way. Okay. There's no reason to do it. What he was trying to do was he was trying to say that Jesus can change anybody's life. <laughs> Jesus can take a person, no matter how disreputable their past, Jesus can take them, forgive them, and set them free from their former sins and give them a new life. And by linking the end of chapter 7 with the beginning of chapter 8 and casting Mary Magdalene as the woman who comes into where Jesus is and wipes his feet, he's that what the Pope's intention was, was to suggest that she is someone who came from a really rough background, but Jesus totally changed her life. And so the, the idea being that it's not so much that Mary had, it's not so much that Mary was a bad person, it's that Jesus has the power to save, to save anybody. Jesus can take anybody in whatever condition they are and change their life. That's what he was trying to do. Okay, the problem with that, aside from the fact there's no reason to link chapter seven with verse eight in, or chapter eight in that way, aside from that fact, the fact is, is that if you preach a sermon and you say that about somebody and then say Jesus changed their lives, you are not likely, you are likely to hear that in such a way that you remember the first part and you don't so much remember the second part. For example, if I were to preach a sermon, and I were to preach, if I were to be in the course of my sermon, were to tell, if I were to tell a story and say, well, I mean, I'll just say, I were to tell a story and I were to tell about how I used to be uh, strung out on cocaine. Now, I've never been strung out. I've never tried cocaine. Can't say that about pot, but I can say that I've never, I've never, never used cocaine ever in my life. Uh, and but but I but I tell this story in a sermon, and I I tell people about how I used to be just addicted to cocaine and crystal meth, and and was addicted to all kinds of drugs, and I lived this totally dissolute life where I was, you know, just jumping from one bed to another and all this kind of stuff. And then Jesus got a hold of me saved me well <laughs> what are you likely to remember from that sermon At the, later on what are you likely to remember that sermon you're going to remember you're not going to you're not going to walk away from that sermon saying wow jesus can save anybody no you're going to hear that and you're going to say wow pastor tom used to be strung out on cocaine <laughs> well, <laughs> that's what you're going to remember <laughs> you know for the name himself I so. objectify Mary Magdalene like that is to is really to use her to well use it, well yeah no no it was a it was a bad decision it was a bad decision all the way around it uh, tagged her forever oh we did tagged it, her for roles for women in the church too so I oh mean, we did was, oh we did oh no we did it had terrible effects it wasn't it, just that. It wasn't just that, was it? I mean, I, not to attack Mary Magdalene, but wasn't it? You tell me, Tom. I, I'm oh, not okay. in these times, but uh -huh. wouldn't it be highly unusual 
for a woman other than a camp follower to be moving around like that with a crowd, highly unusual with, with mostly men. It, I, I suspect in those times it would be not unique, but probably highly unusual. So I, I, for that reason, she might, people might whole, think she was a camp follower. Well, perhaps, perhaps, but in the whole thing about Jesus was unusual. I mean, I mean, just just the whole thing. The whole thing was unusual. I mean, the very fact that Jesus is going from place to place and he's got a big following of of anybody, you know, who are following him from place to place. I mean, that already is unusual. Um, I mean, it's unusual, in other words, too. it's unusual for a man to do it. You know, it's unusual for anybody to do it. Um, is it is it possible that Mary could do it? and be attacked for it in a way that a man wouldn't be attacked for it i think so I possibly think so. very possibly yeah very possibly. I, that, that's my point yeah yeah I, that, that's I probably I, yeah that's I, probably I, fair yeah yeah but but the thing is and he, but here's the thing here's the thing is that there's no evidence from first century or second century jewish writing or christian writing to suggest that Mary was understood that way then. Okay. There was no, there's no evidence that anyone did that anyone did in fact make that attach, attach that to her or defame her in that way. The fact is, is that the early church fathers from the first, you know, the apostolic fathers all the way through, you know, to the fifth century, there's never a negative mention of Mary Magdalene. She is consistently lifted up by the church fathers as a wonderful human being and an admirable figure who did great things. I mean, no, was, there's no it? whiff. There's no whiff of negativity about her until until this Pope Gregory sermon in the 500s. And then thereafter, thereafter, this this idea that she was a prostitute gets attached to her and it sticks. And it, well, gets, I think, it gets played in, out. Yeah. yeah. In defense of Bill's point, yeah. I think we have become to think that of groupies that follow musical groups sure, and things. Sure. You know, we think the groupies are loose women that, <laughs> that you know, are up for anything there. So right, 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 right. The real groupies. I'm not talking about fans, you know. Right, right. No, the no, ones no, that yeah. travel to everything and do that. And, yeah, and yeah. that's what we have learned to think. So it's easy for us to think that about Mary Magdalene. They, since she's the only one. She's the groupie. Right, right. Now, of course, it goes without saying, too, that, uh, you know, as it as they say, it takes two to tango uh, that uh, that that even if that's true, even if even if it's true that the the that some of the women or some, that some of the women following along are loose, uh, it follows that there there's some male people who are loose, too. You know, <laughs> there's. Oh, yeah. I mean, it, you know, it's, not, it's not just a female thing, but but it is but is it is true. It is true that men and women are not treated equally in this. Uh, but wasn't in, she in considered one of the leaders of the church? She was she was certainly considered later uh, on. Yeah, I mean, something she was, I read said she was she was kind of in in. Um, uh, she she was one of Peter's. Um, senior moment <laughs> oh, okay okay uh, she, she, she was she was she was a um um uh, kind of kind of um a, an, a, this bleh. okay she was she was certainly highly honored uh you know there were early christians you know sometimes took took things in different directions and there were some early Christians that had higher views of women in leadership than she was a other, competitor than for, other Christians for Paul, with Peter. At, yeah, at one term. there a were competitor. some. There were some Christians who took took Mary Magdalene's role 
in the early church differently than other Christians did. Uh, and, and, and sometimes that did play out in terms of, you know, how, how certain Christians versus the way other Christians viewed women in leadership. Uh, there were, uh, clearly, there were Christian groups that were very negative on women being leaders in churches. There were other churches that had the very opposite view. Mm -hmm. it, like may go, it may go without saying that those churches that had a much more positive view of women in leadership also developed stories, you know, told stories in which Mary Magdalene is has a more has a more visible role in those stories, mm -hmm. you know. Um, what the role actually was is hard to say because we don't we don't really know. Uh, yes, yeah, she had a she had a um, mm -hmm. a prominent role in the whole picture. Yeah, and what that in but she wasn't the only one. We there were other women know. that were there too. Oh yeah, yeah. The and, 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 at the end of Luke seven, at the end of Luke mm -hmm. seven, there were there were other women listed there too, um, and uh, but they were they were shielded from Pope Gregory's uh, mis misinterpretation by the fact that they were properly married. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, Sarah. You do have to remember that this is just the beginning of the church's put down of women. Oh yeah, I mean, really not. Yeah, I I read. You guess me well, about um, Peter having a wife and family, and I just thought, you know, here's Peter, the Bishop of Rome, who becomes the Bishop of Rome, and and advocates celibacy for people who are bishops and priests and so forth. I mean, it's so ironic that the church's attitude toward women has been ghastly since at least yeah. the you know, this is terrible. Uh, yeah. Now I will say, I will say that the celibacy for priests is something that didn't happen for several hundred years after the time of the apostles. That was way, that was a, a lot later. Uh, mm -hmm. But, but it is ironic given that about what we know about Peter. That, the is that women as being unclean and so right. forth. And or human beings not allowed close to the altar, not allowed even to read for centuries. Right. In, in, right. And that, you know, and that that's something that uh, in the early in the earliest days of the church, that was not as that was not as big of a problem. There was some there was some carryover. There was some carryover anti woman patriarchal bias from, you know, from the Jewish religion and from and from uh, from, you know, from pag the pagan world as well. It got worse, though, as we as we moved out a little bit from the time of Jesus, it got worse. And St. Augustine in the fifth century didn't help. Uh, <laughs> institutional church, you know, the institutional church developed, yeah. spread, and became incredibly powerful and stringent and its attitude toward women. This is part of my work on Flannery O'Connor. So I have a, I've done some reading on this and it just. Makes my yeah. blood boil as you. <laughs> Absolutely. 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 Well, let me, uh, I know we only have just a few more minutes and uh, well, I'm glad we've been talking about what we have been talking about, but we do need to, yeah. I do want to say something about the verses 33 through 37, just as a kind of a follow-up to, to the, just to the theme that was brought up of the disciples arguing with themselves about who's who's the greatest. They know that Jesus is going to jump on them if they say that. They it's forced out of them by Jesus. Uh, it is interesting to me that Jesus doesn't, when he finds out that that's what they've been arguing about, that he doesn't actually jump on them. What he does is he takes a child, whoever the child is. He takes the child, the child, you know, that doesn't have, you know, high social standing or whatever. In other words, a child who by the world standards is not great. 
and he takes the child and he basically lifts up the child. Now, this is Mark's version of what is going to be expressed in Matthew and Luke later uh, and expanded a little bit. And in either Matthew or Luke, Jesus is going to say, or is going to, it's going to present Jesus as saying that whoever would enter the kingdom of heaven has to enter like a child. Okay. Mark doesn't re relay that part of that. Um, it's, it, it's, it's a more limited, it's a shorter version of, of the same thing. Um, uh, but the fact that the child is in the story at all is meant to be a rebuke to the entire line of thought that the disciples are on. Uh, this is, uh, if, if any of you by now have listened to my sermon from last Sunday, uh, in which I talk about uh, the about the nature of the Bible and what the Bible, the power that the Bible has to shape the way we ask questions and how we look at the world. This is actually a really, although this doesn't come so much in the form of a well, actually it does form in the in the form of a question. Jesus asks a question. Jesus asked the question, what were you arguing about on the way? There's good reason to believe Jesus is like a good lawyer here. A lawyer, you know, they say that a good lawyer never asks a question that he that he or she doesn't know the answer to. <laughs> okay. A lawyer only asks a question that they know the answer to. Jesus knows the answer to the question. He knows what they've been arguing about. But he asks the question so as to set up a teachable moment he knows that the that the disciples are asking a question of their own who's the greatest who among us is the greatest and rather than simply answering the question well peter you're the greatest or none of you are the greatest you are all equally stupid. You know, you're all equally useless, you know, or something. He doesn't answer the question. What he does is he provides a teaching moment in which the disciples can slowly come to see that their question itself is wrong, that they are literally asking the wrong question. They are literally asking the wrong question and that they need to be they need to have their consciousness shift in a way they need to repent in the in the greek sense of repentance they need to have a shift in perspective so that they start asking the right questions rather than the wrong questions the wrong question is who of who among us is the greatest that's the wrong question uh and so, uh, and so, this is a good example of this. And so, Jesus uses the child as a as a visible rebuke to them, a teachable moment in which they can slowly come to see that they're on the wrong path, and they need they need to shift the way they're looking at this and get on the right path. Um, just out of interest. Uh, has anybody listened to that sermon? <laughs> I did. You did. Okay. Okay. I, I'm not I saying you must listen to the sermon. I'm just saying that that if you if you do listen to it, you'll uh, you'll see you'll see how this passage is a really nice example of the point that I was making in that sermon, specifically applied to Jesus, uh, where where the where so much of the inspiration of the scripture is not so much in the firm answers that it gives us, you know, the firm propositional truth, as much as it, it, it is a, scripture is a principal means by which the spirit works on us and shifts our perspective over a lifetime, you know, shifts our perspective constantly 
to look at something, to look at life, to look at the, our circumstances in different ways, such that we're more, we're, we're moving more faithfully uh, in discipleship than not. All right. All right. It is 1108. This is probably a good time to knock off uh, for today. We are going to start back up. We are going to start back up, and I was looking actually at the wrong thing. We are going to start back up at verse 38 next week, okay? Uh, we're going to start back up at verse 38 and uh, presumably finish chapter 9 <laughs> next week. All right. Anyway. Okay, well... Uh, we will uh, we'll go ahead and leave. I know I know Bill had to go ahead to go ahead and leave, but we will go ahead and pray, and then we will um, we will be on our way. Let's uh, just real quick, uh, Sarah. We of course will continue to uh, to pray for you, and if and certainly Sarah, if there's anything that I can do, uh, anything I can do, or any of us can do, you know, to uh, to all so much. Help so you. far, so good. Good, good. Uh, and uh, of course, Lois, we're uh, continuing to pray for Bill, uh, and to and to pray for you, as you, uh, as you, as you, as you help Bill with with his uh, with his uh, with his uh, therapy and uh, and all other. Pray for patience. Patience. <laughs> patience yes. for me. Yeah. Indeed. For you or for Bill? For me. <laughs> Both, I'm sure. Both, I'm sure. But yeah, yeah, patience. Okay. Okay. And uh, yeah. Okay. All right. Well, let's uh, let's 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 close with her. And of course, we continue to pray for uh, those in Ukraine and uh, and for peace, peace in the world in general. And, My and, sister Carol is doing very well, so you probably don't have to pray for her anymore. At least for now, she's doing good. I'll throw we'll, we'll throw in a good word for her. Okay. <laughs> That's why she's doing good. And also, excuse me, and also for Sandy Hudson. Oh, who okay. Is, her shoulder has collapsed. The one that she had repaired. Oh, really? oh, oh my gosh! Hey, when is did that, that happen? When did that about happen? About a week ago, and uh, she can't lift her arm. She's going. You know, they're going to do something about it, but somehow inside it didn't heal. Oh, I don't, that's about all I understand about her medical situation. Okay. Okay. I'm glad, I'm glad that Sandy, I mean, Lois is too, but I'm, I'm glad that, uh, that Sandy is in my Ollie class right now. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, uh, okay. she's around, but she just can't move her, her arm. But yeah. I think, I think she mentioned that last week. Yeah. All right. All right. Okay. Well, let's, uh, let's pray and then we will, we'll be on our way. All right. Lord, we give you thanks for this day and for this opportunity to gather as we do every week. We are most appreciative for the way your spirit works in and through our, our very incomplete and human attempts to, to understand this ancient text, this, this ancient word. But we thank you for the way that you do work with us and through us as we wrestle with it, and you teach us through it. You bring your living and active word to us still today. Lord, we thank you for the way that you shift our perspective and you help us to see things in new lights and how you, you challenge our questions themselves in such a way that we ask, that we learn to ask the right questions. Lord, we lift up to you those whom we have named, uh, who are struggling with, with anything in their lives. Lord, we, we do lift up to you, Sarah, and pray for her continued healing. We pray for Bill and for Lois, for Bill's healing and for Lois's patience. <laughs> 
we pray for we pray for Carol. We thank you for the great progress that she has made, and and pray that that progress continue. We pray for Sandy and for her shoulder, and and pray that she heal heal quickly from that. Lord, we also pray for for all the troubles of the world, and for and we pray for peace in the world, and especially in Ukraine, and pray that the Ukrainians will soon will soon greet uh, days of peace with justice. Lord, we, we pray for all people everywhere who are struggling in any way with any, with any kind of trial. Lord, we now lift up all these things to you in the strong name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.